Father, we thank you for your presence. That you would do us the favor of meeting here with us today. Thank you for the songs that have reminded us that our lives should be about bringing you glory and honor and worship to you. Thank you for reminding us through the song that whatever we are facing, no matter how difficult things may be, that we're not in this alone. Your word reminds us that you never leave us. You never forsake us. And we ask that by your Holy Spirit's presence and power today, that you would minister to the heart, the mind, the emotions, the spirit of every individual who's made the effort to be here today. May we surrender everything that we have and all that we are to you. And in that process, draw ever closer to you. Lord, we're overwhelmed by your presence and spirit in this place. Open our ears to hear your word today. May this not be just another Sunday service. But may we experience you in a very personal and real and powerful way. So that as we leave today, there will be no doubt that we have been with you. That our lives have been changed and impacted by your presence. As only you can do. For these things we pray and ask now in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus. And everybody said, Hey man, I, I listen... I, I could just let them sing a few more songs and just worship and just go home and say, it's been good to be in the Lord's house. Listen, folks, don't, don't ever take for granted the presence of God when He meets with us. What a, what a precious, precious gift. Today we begin a brand new series. It's going to last for eight weeks. Don't sigh. It's going to go by quickly. The series is called Disciple, and we're going to look every week at a different dimension of what it means to be a disciple. And if you'll notice the word, every week we're going to take a letter out of the word disciple. Today we're beginning with D, which stands for daily prayer, and examine that from a scriptural standpoint. And hopefully we're all going to learn how to be better disciples. Let, let me make this point very clear at the beginning of this series. There's a difference in saying, I know Jesus, and being a disciple. One is very superficial. One's just fire insurance. One is a personal walk and relationship with him. And we should all desire to become a true disciple. One of the ways here at church that we are being intentional about helping you with this attribute of daily prayer is at the beginning of the year, we started with 21 days of prayer here at the church. This coming Saturday at 9 o'clock, the church will be open for prayer to anybody that wants to gather and pray. Then starting August the 4th, we're going to have another 21 days of prayer. In case you haven't been with us, what that looks like every morning at 7 o'clock, we have a time of praise and worship. We then go into about a 10-minute Bible study related to prayer. And then we have about 30 minutes on your own time to pray. And then we gather back corporately, have another song of praise and worship, and usually wind up with some type of corporate prayer. And all that takes place in the context of an hour. And if you've never experienced it, I, I tell you, it will change your life. I encourage you to come be a part of it as much as you can. 
One of the things I know about prayer from personal experience and just being in church most all my life is a lot of people, even when you say prayer, don't understand what prayer means. It literally is communicating with God. It's not just talking to Him, but it is listening to Him as well. Prayer can be misapplied, mis, uh, misused. Let me give you some examples. Uh, if you can share that slide with me with the first picture. A lot of people, if you've been praying this this week, Oh, Lord, we pray a hedge of protection over these vessels, which we are not worthy. These conditioners of air, Lord, we pray you might fill them with a double portion of Freon and unmatched work ethic during these next couple of trying weeks in the absolute sauna that's in the south and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. A lot of you have prayed that prayer, haven't you? And I understand this week you'll need to pray it some more. I read this quote this week. He said, some Christians spend six days a week sowing wild oats. Then they come to church on Sunday and pray for crop failure. Because a lot of times we just pray crisis prayers, right? Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Don't sometimes we get in a habit, we just pray crisis prayers. Lord, rescue me, deliver me. This one I can really relate to, the story of a husband who came home with an almost empty Krispy Kreme donut box. His wife said, you know better. You're not supposed to be eating that stuff. In fact, the doctor told you, you needed to lose 30 pounds, and you're never going to do it this way. He said, well, I want you to know I prayed about it. He said, when I left the house and I went by, he said, I prayed. I said, Lord, if it's your will for me to get and eat these donuts, let the hot and ready sign be on. And let there be an empty parking space in the front parking lot. He said, and the eighth time that I circled around the block, there it was. That's not the kind of prayers we're talking about. We're going to look to the one who taught about prayer, that being Jesus. And I hope you understand there's no better teacher than Jesus and the words of Jesus. So go with me to the book of Luke, chapter 11. Luke, that's a New Testament book. He was a Gentile follower, disciple, not one of the original 12, but a disciple of Jesus. He was also a physician. He wrote the book of Luke and also the book of Acts. And this is what he records here related to prayer. He said, once Jesus was in a certain place praying... I can tell you from personal experience, if you and I are going to develop a daily habit of prayer, there needs to be a place. It's good to have an attitude of prayer throughout the entire day. We all need to be doing that. But I'm talking about where you meet alone with God and Jesus found it necessary, and there are many accounts of Scripture, where he went to be alone to pray at a certain place to pray. The place is important because the implication is he found a place, listen to me, that was free of hindrances and distractions. Let's put it in, in where we can understand it. He went to a place where he wasn't checking his cell phone and his emails and his text and his social media every 30 seconds. Oh, I got no support. It's okay. He went to a designated place to pray, to communicate with his heavenly Father. So a place is important, not just a physical place. I have two or three of those places that I typically go most every morning. But it's not just a physical place. It is a mental place and a spiritual place. If you're going to be effective in daily prayer to God through Jesus, you're going to have to be in the right place. Location, mind, emotion, spirit. Notice, and he goes on to say, as he finished. There's a clear indication Jesus had a start time to this occasion, this prayer. He had a place he went to that was isolated and alone from distractions. He started and there was a time when he stopped, meaning he put a period behind it and he moved on to something else. I just told you, constant. Spirit and attitude of prayer is a great thing. We need that. But we also need a designated time, 
of prayer if it's going to become a daily habit. We're talking about becoming a disciple. Disciple and discipline are the same root word. I hope you understand. It says, and as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. I appreciate the fact that this particular disciple wasn't just interested in saying, hey, give me some insights personally so that I can pray better. He said, corporately, we need to become better prayer people. Can I tell you one of the greatest needs in the church, in this church, is the fact that we all need to become better prayer people. I love the fact in the passage of Scripture where Jesus said, my house should be called a house of prayer. He said, Lord, teach us, all of us. Notice these are already disciples. They are already in relationship with Jesus. They are already walking with him, looking at him, listening to him. And they said, we need to learn how to pray better. I find it interesting that in the scripture, there's nowhere, nowhere, nowhere that Jesus ever taught anybody how to preach. He didn't teach anybody how to sing. But there are multiple occasions where he taught people how to pray. And they said, teach us, Lord, to pray. One of the reasons they wanted him to teach them how to pray is because when he prayed, he saw results. Can I get real personal right here for just a minute? This isn't intended to make you angry or upset. This is intended to help us all because I'm included in this. You can't spend all week long on everything other than the things of God and expect to bring a 30-second prayer to him and him show up on your behalf. Oh, I, I, oh, I see the pushback. That's not discipleship. That is convenience. That's my grocery list. God, give me this and do this. And by the way, if you do it before I get to the end of the driveway, I would appreciate it. They saw in Jesus a daily life of prayer and the results and the power in his life to be an effective witness through prayer. And so they said, Lord, we want some insights. And now... The good thing is he answered that prayer immediately because he starts teaching about it. And what we're going to look at in the next few verses is this prayer. We often call it the Lord's Prayer. It's not the Lord's Prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. It's a model prayer that lists categorically some areas that we need to be focused on in prayer. Now, I'm not saying you have to cover them all every time you pray, but you should cover them all at some point in time in your prayer life. And here's what I find really interesting in this next few verses that we're going to look at. Jesus spends three verses here in the scripture to talk about six elements of effective, powerful prayer. And when he gets through with that one, then he spends six verses talking about one element of prayer. We're going to see that we're familiar with the first few elements. We seldom ever talk about the last one, which I think is absolutely Essential. Look at verse 2. After he's asked to pray, and he said, just as John taught his disciples. By the way, if you look ahead in verse uh, chapter 5, verse 33, we are very clearly told that John and his disciples were known for their constant, daily, reoccurring prayer and fasting. Look at verse 2. Jesus said, literally answered, responded to this disciple's request which in and of itself was a prayer. Do you understand there was communication taking place? What did I say earlier? Communication is, or prayer is communication with God. And so Jesus responds, verse 2, Jesus said, and I'm going to look at and give you six elements here, and then we're going to go and look at the last element in just a moment. Verse 2, Jesus said, notice, this is how you should pray. Notice he did not say this is what you should pray. Now, go ahead and say this. There is absolutely nothing wrong with praying what we refer to as the Lord or Disciples Prayer. If you pray it every day a hundred times, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's a good outline and model for you to kickstart prayer on a daily basis in these categories. 
He said, but this is how you should pray. And the very first thing he lists, number one, if you're taking notes, is he said to address God as your Father. It would change the dynamics of how we pray, when we pray, if we understood that when we pray to God, He is our Heavenly Father. He's not a tyrant that is up there somewhere in outer space looking down, waiting for me to make one more mistake so He can rain down fire and judgment on me. No, He loves you. One person believes that in this building. God, who created everything that exists, including you, loves you intimately. I was joking with a couple of folks in the back because they were coming in this morning. We were talking about knowing each other and how we and sometimes that's problematic. Listen, God already knows every detail of your life, including all of your past, and he still loves you. Isn't that great news? Jesus himself, as he's beginning to teach, he said, when you come to God in prayer, first of all, realize that you have direct access to him. He is your father. The Aramaic means Abba, father, daddy. That's the kind of intimate relationship he desires to have with us when we communicate with him and to him, when we pray to him. But he doesn't stop there. He says, first thing is address him as your heavenly father, intimate relationship. Second of all, he said, may your name be kept holy. Some translations say, hallowed be thy name. Keep his name holy. There's a balance here. And listen, this can get tricky. When you pray, you ought to pray because you know that he loves you and you've got an intimate relationship and you can just go to him as your father. But part of the problem with that is if we're not careful, we get too casual and we say things like, I'm going to talk to the man upstairs, the big guy in the sky. No, that's not honoring who God is. We need to keep a healthy balance of knowing he's our father that loves us and cares for us and also a healthy balance of who he is that we reverence and, and honor him in a sacred way. Do you see the difference? He said you need to do both when you come to him in prayer. So we've got intimacy as father. We got honoring and reverencing, having all for him and his name, which represents his character. Thirdly, the third part he addresses in this, quote, model prayer is, may your kingdom come soon. Let me give you two aspects to what this means. One is, we should always keep an eternal perspective when we pray. I hope it's because you're just soaking up, go, oh, that's good. We should always have an eternal perspective when we pray. Why is that so important? It's because the things that you may be praying about or asking for right now are to you the biggest things that have ever been or ever will exist when in reality of eternity it's just a speck of time and it's just a little thing. That's how Paul was able to say these momentary light afflictions. And he, he went through stuff that you and I are never going to go through. He said because of the glory that awaits, he had an eternal perspective. It's important that when you pray, you have an eternal perspective. But let me give you a secondary meaning that you may have never thought about this phrase where Jesus said one of the categories, when you pray, you ought to be saying your kingdom come soon, looking for Jesus' return, looking for an eternal perspective. But do you understand it also means that as disciples, his followers, that when we pray that, we are saying to him, I want your kingdom to be ushered in right here today, right now now in my area of influence because of the way that I live and act and behave and treat people. I see some of you go, whoa, whoa, I never heard that. That's why we're teaching. That this implication is about eternal perspective, but it's also about, listen to me carefully, it's about saying every day, Jesus, I realize my life doesn't belong to me. How can I live for you in obedience and walk according to your statutes and your word? And how can I take the high road and do the right thing even though it's not easy to do? That's one of the ways that we ensure that the kingdom of heaven comes into the earth. Look around this room, 200 whatever people are in this room. And think of the influence that you and I should be having each and every day for the kingdom of God that ought to be ushered in constantly 
because of the life that we're living and the obedience that we're giving to the things of God. So now let's look at the fourth element of this model prayer that Jesus shared with them. Give us each day the food we need, literally our daily necessities. One, that's a good thing to praise because we should realize that whatever we have and whatever we will have in the future is a direct result of God's blessings on our life. There's a scripture that says it is God who gives us power to get wealth. And I know what some pe people are thinking right now. I can almost see it on your face. Well, I, I, I'm going to say it this way. I'm not, I'm not wealthy like some of you people are. If you had a place to sleep last night and you had food to eat yesterday and you got clothes to put on your back, you are a wealthy person. If you have family and friends and people who love and support and care about you, you are a wealthy person. If your name's in the Lamb's book of life and you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are a wealthy person. And when we pray that, we are acknowledging our dependence on God for everything. Listen, we typically don't think in these terms, but do you understand that every breath that you are taking right now, including the one you just took, it don't belong to you to start with. It's a gift from God. That's a necessity, isn't it? And he says you, you need to understand when you pray that everything that we have, everything that we need, comes from God. Now look at verse 4. Here's the fifth element of this model prayer. And Remember now, today we're talking about becoming a better disciple through daily prayer and intercession. Here's the part we like to skip over sometimes. This should be a regular part of our prayer life. He said, forgive us our sins. He said, that's, that's one thing we should pray. Listen, as a believer, I'm going to go ahead and confess to you right now that this week, <laughs> y'all hoping for details, aren't you? You ain't going to get them. <laughs> this week, I needed to say, God, I'm coming to you to spend some time in prayer, but first of all, I need to acknowledge what you already know about what I said, what I did, what I thought, what I wish I could do. Don't look at me like that. Jesus said to the disciples, believers, that asking forgiveness for things in our life ought to be a daily part of our prayer life. And he didn't stop there. He said, forgive us our sins as or accordingly that we forgive those who sin against us. We will address the first part of that much quicker. The part about, Lord, forgive me. Yes, I, I probably shouldn't have thought that, said that, acted that way. I may be gotten out of line. Lord, forgive me. We will address that part much quicker than the part where, Lord, you know how they treated me, how they responded, what they said, what they did, and how that hurt offended me and, and caused damage in my life. Will you please forgive them? One of the things that breaks fellowship with God that keeps us from having an effective daily prayer life is unforgiveness in our life toward other people. Mm. Even as a disciple, a follower of Christ, and literally what Jesus was saying, when you are reminded in prayer of what you've been forgiven of in your sin debt, it ought to be a natural outflow that you are intentional about forgiving and releasing those people. <laughs> I'm on my own, aren't I? Let, let me give you a quick illustration. I saw this this week. Can you give me that next slide of the, of the locks? If you go to a bank safe deposit lock and there are certain safes just like this one right here that require two keys to open something to be able to access it. 
And that's the way I see this verse right here. We, we are held in chains and bondage and sin. It's like a cage. It's like a prison. And we are quick to pray and ask God sometimes when things get bad enough to forgive me of my sin, open this, this gate and let me go. And he said, don't you forget, there's another part of the equation. It takes two locks to open this thing. There's your responsibility to let other people go too. I wish I had time just to stay right there. The re- go, go back, go back. The, the, the part of the reason we stay chained and locked up, even when we've asked Jesus in our heart, we've never taken the courage on the next step to put the key of our forgiveness in it so they can turn the handle and let us walk free. Whew, I don't know who I'm talking to today, but this is, mm, this is life-changing stuff right here. And this is what Jesus taught us when we pray. He said, oh, I, somebody, somebody just had this thought right over here. I'm not pointing a finger. Somebody just had this thought. How do I know who to forgive and when I need to forgive them? Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you got that thought. The answer is when the Holy Spirit, when you're in prayer and the Holy Spirit brings that person to your mind, that is the time and the place to put the key in and turn the lock and let them go. He said, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And and the sixth element of this model prayer that will help us in our daily prayer life to become a better disciple, he said, and don't let us yield to temptation. I've said it numerous times. It's not the temptation that's the problem. Temptation in and of itself is not the sin. It's how we respond to the temptation. And let me tell you this. If as a believer, you may have walked with Jesus for 20 years, 30 years, and you say, well, I'll tell you what, I'm better than pretty much anybody else I know. I'm glad I don't struggle like some of the other weaker believers around me. I need to remind you the passage of Scripture says, to he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he falls. And pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit goes before a fall. I was having a conversation with my wife recently, and I said to her, in some areas of my life, the way that I keep from falling into sin in some of those areas is to constantly be reminded that I am susceptible to falling into sin. You with me? It's when we become so arrogant. Well, I, yeah, yeah, I never do that. I never struggle with that. You better shut your mouth. Because temptation is going to plague you. And without daily prayer, strengthen us in this prayer. And he said, don't let us yield to temptation. Notice Jesus is doing the teaching. Jesus did not say to the disciples, pray that I'm never tempted. Isn't that interesting? He didn't, he didn't say that. He said to the disciples, he said, you need to make this part of your daily prayer that I don't yield to it. That I don't give in to it. What, why did he say that? It's because we have responsibility in the matter. I'm going to throw this little bit of information out for you. Sometimes, I don't know how we get this concept that if I pray about something, I am now resolved of all my human responsibility in the matter. You can pray, Lord, keep me from falling in temptation 72 times a day, but when temptation comes, if you don't say no... then there you go. He said, we do have responsibility. We pray to God for these things to help, but then we have to step up and do our part in it as well. And so we have just looked at six elements of this model prayer that Jesus shared with the disciple that said, teach us to pray. They are all categorically important areas, aren't they? Now we're going to shift focus just a moment. The next six verses deal with one more element of prayer, and it is rare that we ever talk about it. I hear people talk about, quote, well, I've, I've walked in a bunch of houses where the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer, the model prayer is up on a wall, but I have never seen 
where the rest of these verses in order are posted in somebody's house. And normally we talk about this prayer and there we leave it there. And listen, that's good. There, there are six great elements of prayer that we ought to apply when we go to God. But let's look at this last element beginning in verse 5 and look at these next six verses that deal with this one issue of prayer. Verse 5 says, Then teaching them more about prayer, he, meaning Jesus, used this story. He said, Suppose you went to a friend's house. Well, so far, so good. It's a friend's house. Everything ought to be hunkadory. But then he throws this caveat in there that would be problematic for most all of us. They came at midnight. If you show up at my house at midnight, I'm going to greet you, but I'm going to be accompanied by <laughs> you understand, right? We live here in the rural south. But he, he, in the story, Jesus said, this guy went to his friend's house at midnight and he, he went wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. Now, not three loaves like we get at the grocery store. Let's make an equation to it. Three slices of bread. Three biscuits. Three pieces of cornbread. It's getting better on time, isn't it? He said, this guy went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three pieces of slices of bread. He says, but you say to him, verse 6, a friend of mine, meaning another friend. So you got the one guy going to the next friend's house. And by the way, Jewish culture was much different than ours. They lived very communal, very close together. It was very customary for them to show kindness and hospitality to friends, family, and even to strangers, even to take people in for the night. Well, that's a big change from where we live, isn't it? So you got this guy going to this guy's house at midnight wanting to borrow some bread. And he says to, to the man of the house, he says, a friend of mine, meaning another person just showed up, has arrived for a visit. You following the story? Do you understand that the guy who's asking to borrow the bread had the other visitor show up unexpectedly at his house also about what time? Midnight. That's some late travelers. He says, has just arrived for a visit, unplanned, unexpected, and I have nothing for him to eat. We see three men in this story. One is hungry. One is trying to be a good host. And we see the third one is hesitant to step up. And meet the need. If, if you don't remember anything else, what I say today, you need to remember this point right here. So many Times you and I are the answer to the prayer that other people have prayed to God about. Mm. God does work supernatural miracles. He's still in the miracle working business. But most often he uses other people as the answer to the prayer that somebody else has prayed yes. dear lord yes. and as a church if we can get to the point where we recognize we hold the answer to somebody's prayer god will be glorified a thousand times more than what he's already being done yes. Yes. i hope you see this principle in this hungry man the host and the hesitant man. He says, I have nothing for him to eat. Verse 7. 
And suppose he calls out from his bedroom. This is the guy living in the house that apparently has the food where the other friend has come over and said, hey, I got this need. Somebody just showed up. I ain't got no bread. And he said, he's really hungry. Can you, just, can you just loan me some bread? The guy doesn't even bother to get up out of bed. He calls out, responds to him from his bedroom. Lazy people aren't going to be the answer to somebody else's prayer. Oh, Lord have mercy. It is going to be an inconvenience to you and I and to the church sometimes to meet the needs of other people when they have a need and we are supposed to be the answer to their prayer. Mm. Oh, I'm fired up about this point and I'm scared because I don't want to run you all off. But you can't live a life of 100% convenience and be the answer to somebody else's prayer. Sometimes you've got to be inconvenienced and get up when you don't want to get up, go where you don't want to go, and do what you don't want to do, and make a sacrifice to be the answer. Oh, my God, this will change our community if we get a hold of this. Whew. Some of you are scared right now. I'm going to calm down. He says, suppose he comes out from his bedroom. He says, first of all, he said, <laughs> oh, dear Lord, I heard this so many times in different forms. When you ask people to serve in the church, they may not say it this way, but this is exactly what they mean. I'm closing my eyes. So I don't look at nobody right now, so you don't think I'm looking at you. They said, don't bother me. Mm. Did you just say I need to move on? Oh, Okay. <laughs> said, don't bother me. Here's another reason, another excuse. The door is locked for the night. Here's another one. And my family and I are all in bed. They're not asleep because you're shouting back and forth through the house. Sometimes the flimsiest, most ridiculous excuses we give are just as ridiculous as the response of this guy in the house. Screaming from the back of the house to the guy at the front of the door trying to get a need met on somebody else's behalf and ain't nobody in the house sleep because of his shouting. I'm going to move right along. He says, they're all in bed and therefore I can't help you. No, he lied. The answer is I won't help you. I won't be the answer to your prayer to help meet your Need. Because in this moment, his convenience canceled his compassion for anybody else. Then Jesus gets to the next verse. This is so important. Believe it or not, we're almost done. He says, Jesus said, but I tell you this. He said, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, he said, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you notice whatever you need. Now listen, Jesus has been teaching on the principle of what? Prayer. Here's an element he's going to spend all of these verses on dealing with this one issue of persistence in prayer. If you know you are praying and asking for a good thing and something that is godly and according to Scripture, don't give up, don't delay, don't stop praying until you see something move. He says, though he won't get up for friendship's sake, if you keep on knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because, notice, of your shameless persistence. The guy going to the house on somebody else's behalf, he just kept on knocking, 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 knocking. And the guy said, don't bother me. We'll sleep you. And blah, 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 blah. And all those things. He just kept... 
until the guy got up. Till the answer came. Till he saw a breakthrough. And then Jesus continued teaching in verse 9. He said, and so I tell you to keep on asking. I have heard people say this. I struggle with this statement. I think I understand where they're coming from, but, but I think it's erroneous. I have heard people, I've heard preachers, I've heard pastors, managers say, you pray for something one time, and if you ask again, you don't have faith. I don't believe that. I'm going to listen to the teaching of Jesus, where he said, you just keep knocking. You just keep praying. You just stay persistent and consistent. He said, I tell you to keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, you will find it. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. It doesn't always happen the first time or instantaneously. All times. In fact, I would say most of the time it is a process of persistence. This week, preparing for this message, I, I sent a text out to all of our leadership or deacons, elders, some of our department leaders and I asked a simple question. I said, what is the longest period of time that you have ever prayed for someone or a particular situation before you saw a breakthrough or got an answer to what you were praying? And I'm going to share, not in, in names and details, but categorically, I want you to listen to this list that they sent me back. One said, I prayed a year before I even realized that God had already begun to answer my prayer and I didn't recognize it because I wasn't looking for it to come that way. Another one said, I'm still praying for a friend to get saved after, listen, after 30 years. That's persistence. Another one said, I prayed two years for a friend to find Jesus and they said, I was so excited last week they walked into our church. Do we need to be persistent in prayer? Another one said, I prayed 13 years for a family member to come back to Jesus. And they just did. Another one said, I prayed for four years for someone who was in a dangerous and an abusive relationship. And now they are living free and happy. As a result, four years. Another one said, I prayed three years for a teen to turn their heart to Jesus, and now they are walking with Him. Another one said, I prayed five years about a job situation, and during that time I was in a dark season and place in my life. Now God has changed everything and blessed me beyond measure. Another one said, I prayed two years about an out-of-state move and the Lord relocated us here. After two years of praying, seeking. And they went on to say, we've been praying about a year now about a strained family relationship. Can I tell you it's easier for them to keep praying about the strained family relationship a year into it because they prayed two years and saw God move on the other side already. We need to look back at what God's already done and get some faith to rise up in us for what we're praying about right now. Because God's not gone anywhere. His power has not diminished. Here's another one that responded and said, I prayed 35 years for a family member to commit their life to Christ and become a true disciple of Jesus and now they have 35 years here's one more this one said I prayed for months and months for someone who was in a severe car accident and, and by all practical means and I know about that situation even the doctors they, they kind of gave up hope on that person even to live it, it was so bad but this person says we prayed and prayed and prayed all those months and then after surgeries and a long rehabilitation period that person has made a full recovery they're working 
a wonderful job. They have gotten married, and they're expecting a baby soon. Do we serve a living, powerful God? I want you to stand this morning. Jesus took time to give us these seven elements to prayer that are so important. But I want you to notice he spent the biggest majority, six verses, to this one issue. Persistence. Not giving up. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm just going to ask you real quick. Who in here besides me already got my hand up? Say, I need and want to become a better disciple through daily prayer. And with God's help, that's what I want to do. I want to take these principles today. Put them into action. I want my prayer life to be transformed. Yes, you're honest. All over this building. Thank you for being honest. Now, here's the next question. How many of you will say, I have prayed about a circumstance, a situation, a relationship, a healing, a job, a career, a financial breakthrough, relationships that are strained, salvation for people that I know and love? I've prayed for God to deliver me from fear and anxiety and frustration. I have prayed and I have prayed and I have prayed and I've not seen the answer. I've not seen the breakthrough. But I sense faith in this place today and I understand that persistence is as important an element in my prayer as any of the things we've talked about. And with God's help, I'm going to Him one more time trusting Him for what I need in my life. How many folks I got in this house today? Yes, all of us.